Good morning. Good morning, Rabbi Otay. Welcome, and bre- uh, welcome to Breakfast on the Class. Today, we are sponsored and dedicated in honor of Roberto Menachem Harari, uh, A.V. Uh, Avi Aben and his wife Cindy. On the day of the Milah of their son, May he bring lots of Nahad and Beracha from his parents, Jack and Tuni Harari. Congratulations. Uh, breakfast on the class, also dedicated in loving memory and Lilui Nishmat, Yaakov Shimon Ben Yisrael Tzvi Alava Shalom, sponsored by his son, Mendy Pollock. Uh, breakfast on the class is dedicated in loving memory of Martin Cohen, Alava Shalom, Lilui Nishmat, Mordechai David Ben Sarah, Alava Shalom, sponsored by his children and grandchildren. And finally, of course, this week of Cold Brew is dedicated in loving memory of Sami Sal Alava Shalom, Lilui Nishmat, Shalom Ben Rivka, Alava Shalom, sponsored by his son, Isaac Sayed. Okay, Rabutai, today I want to talk about something which is very controversial because I think there's a small misunderstanding, okay? And this small misunderstanding has tremendous ramifications. Judaism is built on a concept called Bechira Chofshit, which means that a person has free will. If you remove the subject or the concept of of bechirach of shit, of free will from the equation, the whole of Judaism may as well be thrown in the garbage. Why? Judaism is really all about human beings' choice, our ability to make decisions, our ability to choose to do the right thing in difficult scenarios, our ability to push ourselves to do mitzvot or to not do averot. But if a person doesn't have free will, they don't have the ability to achieve bechirach of shit, then what's the Torah about? It's just uh, something telling people that are pre-programmed to do this or to do that, to carry on doing whatever they were doing. So this concept, this issue, is in a large part dealt with in a backhand manner in our parasha. And let me explain what I mean, and then we'll kind of come to the, uh, the part of this idea which I think is very, very Difficult to understand and perhaps controversial at first glance, but I think you'll agree with me once, uh, once we go through this together. Our parasha tells us that God, God tells Moshe, come to Paro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, what's it called, I'm going to uh, work with him uh, and harden his heart in order to be able to show all of my, mir- my miracles and my plagues, and eventually the Jewish people will be let go. And the question is, the most famous question perhaps on the parasha is, how could it be that Paro and the Egyptians are punished for the fact that God hardens his heart? In effect, you've taken away from Paro the ability to decide whether or not to keep the Jews. So the whole thing is really a, a sham. Moshe is coming and saying, let the Jews go. Paro is saying no, but really Paro is not the one saying no. It's Hashem who hardened his heart. And then Hashem is punishing Paro for the fact that he hardened his heart. This is one of the most famous questions on, on the parasha. And there are many approaches to answering the question, ra- ranging from uh, the fact that Paro really chose, but ultimately God just kind of uh, gave him a little hardening of the heart towards the end of each of the three, of Ma- end of the three of Makot. That's one answer. Another answer is that Hashem uh, le- leveled the playing field, so to speak, that since uh, the Egyptians had hurt, harmed the Jews so hard, so difficult, in such a difficult and uh, a heinous way over all the years, so they were deserving of punishment. But in order for Paro to make a free will decision in face of punishment, and not to decide it because of the punishment, he needed to have the courage to be able to withstand the punishments. So the hardening of the heart wasn't overwhelmingly so, but it was rather only in order to even the scales. But I think on some level, all of these answers are at least on a purely intellectual level, purely unnecessary. And let me explain, and I want to share this, the shocking part of this. Maybe it's not true that all of your decisions are in your hands. One more time, let's say that again. Maybe it's not true that all of the decisions that you make are in your hands. Maybe not every experience you have is an example of Bechira Chofshit. Maybe sometimes when you sin, actually you didn't choose to do so, you had no choice. It was too great 
a challenge for you to be able to deal with. And you know what? No matter how hard you would have tried, you still would have failed. Now everyone is wondering, what do you mean? How could you say that? That means that you just absolved me of every time I made a sin. Maybe I couldn't deal with it. Rabbi Utai, I'm not saying all cases. I'm saying some cases. And I want to show you echoes of this idea in different places. And please understand me clearly and spend the time to think through what I'm saying. Because if you don't understand what I'm saying, this idea is very, very dangerous. Okay? But I still think it's worthwhile to examine it. The Midrash tells us, the Gemara echoes this idea that in the story of Yehuda and Tamar, Yehuda interacts with Tamar in what seems to be a way which seems inappropriate. And yet, the Gemara's expression is that um, with the story of Yehuda, Malach Dechavo, an angel pushed him. Now, this is not simplistic. It doesn't mean he was standing over Tamar and the act of intimacy happened because the angel shoved him and he tripped over a rock and he fell and he, and he, and he was intimate with Tamar. That's not what Malach Dechavo means. Malach Dechavo means this was part of a plan that was higher than Yehuda. It was larger than him. It was about, as the Orach Haim HaKadosh writes, it was about the creation of Mashiach. And what that means, Rabotai, is that this had to happen in one way or another. And in order for it to happen in a way where the Yetzirah was not prepared for it, it happened in a way that he couldn't have assumed it. But let's go back to those words. Malach Dechafo. According to the simple understanding over here, there was no choice for Yehuda to do or not to do. He felt compelled to do something that he ordinarily never would have done. Rabotai, I just want to use this idea to share with you. Perhaps that is the case in many instances throughout history. That although, by and large, in almost every scenario, it comes down to you choosing to do the right thing or the wrong thing, it isn't necessarily the case that that is true 100% of the time. Sometimes there are aberrations. Sometimes there are situations in life that are set up where the challenge was not for me to not make a mistake. That was beyond the capabilities that I had. The challenge was to see how would you react after you made a mistake. I want to go back to the beginning of time for one second here. In the beginning of time we read about Adam Arishon that Adam made a sin in the Garden of Eden. He ate from the Etz Adat. And because he ate from the Etz Adat, he was banished from Gan Eden. However, the Gemara also tells us that the process, that the concept of Teshuvah was one of the things that was created before even the world was created. So Teshuvah predates the creation of the world. Now, God says to Adam that on the day that you eat from the tree, you're going to die. But God also builds in. It's not supposed to be that that is the end of the story. Rather, seeing that man would sin, God created Teshuvah. Perhaps what could be understood from that story is that there was always going to be a sin of eating from the Eitz Adat. And in fact, the Maharal says so explicitly. And the proof, Rabotai, is a logical proof. You know, I've explained this already once before. The Etz Hadat, we know, if you eat from the Etz Hadat, what happens? You die, correct? Now, there's also another tree in Gan Eden. What's the other tree called? The Etz Hachaim. That if you eat from the tree, what happens? We know you live forever. Now, hold on. Is there any point in the Etz Hachaim before Adam Arishon eats from the Etz Adat, no. If he doesn't eat from that tree, he doesn't make the sin, he lives forever, correct? So there's no point in eating from the Etz Achaim. The only point, therefore, of eating from the Etz Achaim is when? After eating from the Etz Adat. So that means that it only comes into functional viability after already you've made the sin. But what happens after he eats from the Etz Adat? God says, we better get him out of Gan Eden because he might eat from the Etz Achaim. If you're going to throw him out right after he eats from the Etz Adat, and it has no purpose before he eats from the Etz Adat, what was the point in making the Etz Ahayim? Rabotai, there is much more afoot here in many ways 
than sometimes what we are seeing. And there are lots of times where things happen in a way where the challenge that faces us is not whether or we do or we don't do that thing. It's how we react to and how we fix and how we uh, uh, rebuild after we've done something that perhaps really we always were going to do. I found this idea, this concept, of course it's tremendously dangerous if it's misused. But like everything else, it's up to the human being to decide as and when to interpret uh, those things. Our brains, which is part of the Nisayon that we face every day, our brains decide the texture and the nature of our, uh, of our world. So as an example, I could go to a big rabbi and say to the rabbi, look, rabbi, uh, this man, he cheated me, he did this, he did that, he did, and conveniently leave out all the parts where actually I'm at fault. Then the rabbi answers, no, the halakha is with you. Of course, you presented the halakha that way. Now, the same way you could present, misrepresent a case to a posek, to a dayan, and get the wrong answer, rabbutai, you could also misrepresent a case to yourself. I could decide that I had no choice in this matter. I could decide that it was too difficult. I could decide that I'm not at fault. I could decide that they have to apologize and not me. There's a million ways that I can misrepresent my reality and therefore get a different answer than I would have gotten if I was being honest with myself. However, Rabotai, the thing that struck me so uh, so strongly about this story with the story of Paro is that maybe we don't need an answer as to why God hardened Paro's heart. Maybe the, the reason is because Hashem, we wanted to see in stage two what Paro would do. In other words, the idea that it's not possible to not have a free will choice, that's, that's do I have a free will choice if I was born smart? I don't. Do I have a free will choice to decide if I was born rich? I don't. Do I have a free choice to decide? So that's not fair. Do I have a choice to decide whether I was born patient? I don't have that choice. That means that God did not give me the choice whether or not to be an angry person. I am, let's say by nature, an angry person. The free will choice is now, what do you do with that? If you were born with such a hot temper, odds are you're going to lose your temper more than someone who was born placid, sits back in his chair, you know, everything passes him by, no problem, he doesn't care, he's smoking a cigar. So the challenge of the angry person is to minimize anger. And maybe 10 mistakes out of 100 for an angry guy is better then one mistake out of a hundred from a guy who doesn't actually ever get angry naturally. That's not free will. That's the setup of the challenge. So perhaps over here with, with Paro, the setup of the challenge was, God says, give me five minutes. We haven't started yet. Let's set up the scene. Here's the punishment. Here's the hardening of the heart. Now that we've finished the ten mako, what are you going to do? Maybe the challenge of Paro was whether or not to chase the Jews down to the river. Maybe that's where the challenge was. So Rabotai, I learned from this something very powerful. You know, we judge all the time the people in our lives by their deeds. But actually, a judgment on someone from what they have done is really completely inappropriate. So in other words, from the time we were young, we were taught that if you see someone doing something wrong, you're supposed to judge them favorably, right? It's a halakha. Tzedek tishpot amitecha. Right? Dan lekaf zechut. So I always say this. People assume that dan lekaf zechut, what does that mean? It means I see a guy eating a non-kosher hamburger. I have to assume that he has a stomach ulcer. And if he didn't eat the hamburger, he was going to die. I have to find a way of koshering the act. So the act itself wasn't wrong. But I don't know if that's the only extent of judging favorably. What if judging favorably says to me that I don't need to kosher the act, that maybe what he did or she did was wrong, but I don't know the pressures that they were under that made them commit that act or sin. 
I don't know if I was born with the same temper or with the same impatience or if I had been hurt in the way that that person has been hurt by something similar to this before. I don't know how I would have reacted. Maybe what we're learning or one of the strong ideas that we're learning over here um, is related to the empathy perhaps that we look at people who have done things that we don't approve of or have upset us and we wonder to ourselves maybe they were born with a harder heart. Maybe they were not trained or taught, or maybe they were not born with an ability to understand and be sensitive. Who does that? You know, people will say, who does? I dropped the guy off, da, da, da. the least he could have done what? Okay, in your understanding, in your experience, with your upbringing, that is a natural conclusion. But not for everybody. Maybe that was not his Nisayon. Maybe that's not where he uh, finds his expression of choice. And if that is the case, then I think that we have a platform upon which to judge the people in our lives um, favorably in so many different instances. Maybe this wasn't a choice that they made. Maybe this was beyond their ability to choose. Can I prove this idea to you for one second? Because again, I, I feel like we all ride on our own little high horses. But let me prove this idea to you for a second. Let's say you have a guy, walks in off the street, never went to a synagogue, never went to a Torah class, attended a non-Jewish school, has a non-Jewish girlfriend, happens to walk past the synagogue on Shabbat morning, and he says, oh, that's in such a nice building. And the guard hears him say, oh, it's such a nice building. He says, oh, it's actually a synagogue. And the guy says, oh, it's a synagogue. It's so interesting. I'm Jewish. The guard says, would you like to go inside? The guy says, sure. Comes upstairs, happens to come upstairs right during the putting back of the Sefer Torah. And one of the kids starts to sing beautifully. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, it's so sweet, it's really nice. Feels nice, such a nice thing to see. Look at the kid singing, beautiful voice, little kid. They put the Torah back. The rabbi gets up, gives an amazing speech. The guy's very inspired. He walks out of the synagogue thinking, you know what? I need to get in touch with my Jewish heritage. Do you think, Rabotai, that in Shamaim, in heaven, when he dies after 120, they're going to take him to Dean to task for the fact that he was not Shomer Shabbat for the rest of that Shabbat. Does anyone think that? Guy goes home, walks outside, doesn't know any of the laws of Shabbat. Hasn't been taught anything. Never, never met a rabbi before, never been to a synagogue other than that afternoon. Goes outside, texts his mom. He says, Ma, you don't know, I just went to this amazing you know, Saturday service in the synagogue. It was so nice, so inspiring. I think maybe I'm going to get, get more involved. Does anyone think that at that moment the guy is supposed to keep all of Shabbat? Anyone? Does anyone think that? Does anyone think that a person who's not on the level is going to be judged for things that are far above them? For sure not, correct? If that's the case with this guy on Shabbat, how do you know that that's not the case with someone who's more religious when it comes to acting in, in anger or in being judgmental or speaking Lashon Hara or the way they are in business? Why is it that we decide that we get to occupy the judge, the jury, and the executioner's seat and we decide which Averot and which sins are on that person's level? We have no idea. Is there anybody who's listening to this, wherever you might find yourself, that never did a sin? Nobody. Nobody. Does that make you a terrible person? No. You see, while Paro's heart was hardened in an instantaneous manner, this young fellow from our story, his heart was also hard. Not because God reached in and clogged his arteries, but because he wasn't born with that knowledge or those sensitivities. How do you know whose heart is hard? How do you know who's acting with agency? 
How do you know if someone has a million and one chishuvim? You don't know. In the same way there are things that are outside of your own, of your own ability. There's mitzvot and averot that you are stumbling on. And they're beyond your capacity to even think of doing. Could you imagine? Yes, Rabbi, I learned, I learned Torah. Do you not bitul Torah? You have one second in a day where you didn't waste? Bitul Torah. There was one word that was unnecessary. What are you talking about? Atabesicha. <laughs> Everybody's got stuff. Everybody's got stuff. The Sfat Emet says something beautiful. He says, if you want to judge somebody, the only way to judge someone is by standing in their shoes. And as God tells Moshe before he becomes the leader of all the Jewish people, he says, Shal na'alecha me'al raglecha. Take your shoes off your feet. Because the only way to judge somebody is ad shetagia limkomo until you're standing in his shoes. But you can't wear his shoes with your shoes. The only way is to take off your shoes and stand in his shoes. That's what Moshe was being told by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabotai, everybody's got stuff. You don't know if there was Ani Hechbadti Et Libo, if it was them or if it was Hashem, if it was them or if it was their life circumstance, if it was them or what they happen to be dealing with in this particular moment. Uh, may we be zoche always and ultimately to see uh, every single person we interact with in the very, very best light. And through that have the most beautiful and powerful relationships. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.